Welcome to Healthcare Aptitude with Randy Tomlin, where healthcare's thought leaders will examine ways to address the rising costs of care in America. We'll also examine how the latest advances in mobile apps are helping hospitals and health systems bend the cost curve and improve patient engagement. Hello and welcome to Healthcare Aptitude. I'm your host, Randy Tomlin. Since this is our first radio program together, I want to take a brief opportunity to introduce myself. I'm chairman and CEO of MobileSmith Health. We're a mobile applications company that's virtualizing the front door for health care for 330 million Americans. As a career, I had the pleasure to work for AT&T for about 34 years. I had 35,000 men and women in my organization, and we were very proud to provide telecommunications services across this great country. But in working with an organization that large, what you learn is that every organization runs on people and every set of them come from a family at the heart of that. At the heart of any great organization, you will have employees that you take care of and you fundamentally need to have outstanding health care. Also in my career, I've worked with startup companies, some of them as small as 10 people in the company, some as large as 2,500. But again, there... And when you're serving the public and you're serving in a product, at the heart of that are men and women, and at the heart of all of them is having fundamentally great health care. So that you have these employees, and you take care of them and their families, and they'll take care of you and your customers. So what will we do on this show? The Health Care Aptitude Radio Show will cover a lot of ground in 2020. From the rising cost of health care, and as you know, we spend about 14% of GDP on health care here in the United States, which is twice what any other country spends on health care, and we'll understand why and some opportunities to improve those costs while also improving the outcomes for our great Americans. We'll explore political implications in the upcoming presidential election, and as you know, every candidate has at the top of their platform ideas about how to improve health care. We'll examine some of the groundbreaking advances that healthcare thought leaders and industry influencers are bringing to the table, which are rich opportunities for how we improve healthcare. From an IT standpoint, and we all know that IT and technology are going to help us take healthcare to the next level, we'll address how the latest apps are helping healthcare systems bend cost curve and address the need for better patient engagement and quality outcomes. But we'll also learn best practices from leaders from outside of our industry, how they're helping influence the trajectory of healthcare for years to come. To give you some examples, many industry leaders, whether you look to the banking industry, you look to what's happened in the taxi industry, look what happened to the airline industry. All of them have gone through improvements and consumerizing their products. We can learn from that in healthcare and apply that. We'll talk to some of those leaders. From our great nurses and doctors, we'll go on site and we'll interview directly some of these great providers and leaders. What do they need? What they're all looking for is the opportunity to spend quality time with their patients. How can technology do that? How can we get them face to face and give them back more time? We'll also go to technology providers, whether it's today with what we can do with the global cloud opportunities with AI and how that will apply to healthcare. So I'm very excited about the opportunity to work in healthcare, about the opportunity we have together to bring operations improvement and what technology can be to improve the outcome of healthcare. For 330 million Americans, I'll be with you monthly and I look forward to getting to know each of you as we explore healthcare on Healthcare Aptitude in 2020. Healthcare Aptitude. The U.S. faces a tough road to curb healthcare costs. Here are my thoughts about four ways to get started. What could the U.S. economy do with an additional $1.3 trillion every year? Imagine the infrastructure that could be improved, the poor and homeless people who could be helped, and the investments that could be made in education and social services. I know that we're up to the challenge as healthcare professionals, whether you're a nurse or a doctor or these great technology companies that have come together to work on this problem called healthcare. 
So where would this money come from? This $1.3 trillion represents what businesses, consumers, and the government could save every year if U.S. healthcare spending were at the comparable country average of 10.6% of gross domestic product, or GDP, instead of the 17.1% it is today. Our medical outcomes are no better than those of people in comparable countries, and the life expectancy in our country is slipping. And quite frankly, I believe that we're better than this. No, I know we're better than this, and we will come with an answer to improve health care together. Moving the U.S. closer to the rest of the industrialized world in terms of health care spending and care quality requires a fundamental shift in the way we think about health care. As Albert Einstein said, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we use to create them. But it can be done. And here are four ways that I would think about to get started. Number one, treat hospitals as the last resort providers. Of every health care dollar spent in the United States, 33 cents go to hospitals, another 20 cents go to physicians and clinics, while 27 cents pay for non-physician providers such as nurse practitioners, optometrists, chiropractor, and speech and occupational therapists. When hospitals own physicians and clinics are taken into account, it's fair to say that hospitals control more than half of all health care spending. But hospitals aren't the best place for care in many instances. Consider the lower-cost imaging centers, a walk or a short drive from many hospitals, or day surgery centers versus expensive hospital operating theaters. Many services are inherently cheaper than identical services in a hospital setting because of lower overhead why did banks create branch banking? Why do schools have local schools deep into neighborhoods? Why do local pharmacies have multiple locations? All to take advantage of a distribution model that has multimodality with deep distribution. Of course, hospitals aren't going anywhere, but they shouldn't be the center of healthcare hub either. Do you go to a physical branch bank unless you have an issue that can't self-serve on the bank website or app? No. Retailers are hurting because of the prevalence of online shopping, and even grocery stores are having to rethink their business models with local distribution. Brick-and-mortar attitudes are crumbling in many industries, but hospital thinking around infrastructure is lagging behind. Price-conscious patients are seeking out lower-cost care options, which brings me to point number two. Number two, move care closer to patients. Recall the last time that you went to the doctor for a straightforward appointment, one where you spent 15 minutes or less in front of a physician. If you have a full-time job, how much time did you have to take off for that appointment? Was it convenient to get time off work? Your child out of school? Your parent picked up and transported? Uh, not. If you're lucky, you got the first or second appointment of the day. You might have missed just a few minutes or an hour. More than likely, though, your appointment was at 2 p.m. and you lost nearly half a day leaving work, driving to the office, waiting to be seen, seeing the doctor, checking out, perhaps picking up a prescription or making another appointment, and returning to the office. Technology is changing consumer preferences and self-insured businesses are making more care options available. Why leave the office when you can seek medical care from a nurse line or have a virtual physician visit on your smartphone? Or here's a novel option. The doctor could go to where the patients are congregated, like work, schools, and churches. Nearly 9 in 10 hospital executives agree that their organizations are at competitive risk from non-hospital competitors such as Optum, CVS Health, and Amazon, the number of walk-in clinics continues to grow, and more companies are setting up worksite clinics for employees. One-third of the U.S. companies with more than 5,000 employees have on-site general medical clinics, while 38% have clinics that are focused on occupational health. Perhaps more telling is the 16% of companies in the 500 to 4,999 employee range that have general medical clinics with another 8% saying they'll open a clinic in 2019. Why? That is how companies are going to attract and retain the best talent. 
There is still room for brick and mortar health care in places where it makes sense, but the majority of health care will shift to patient location first, which brings me to item number three. Take costs out of the system. We've all heard tales about the $60 ibuprofen in the hospital when you can pick up a 200 count bottle for four bucks in a big box store. A woman in New Jersey was charged nearly $5,800 for an emergency room visit where she received an ice pack, but no further treatment. Hospitals and other providers jack up prices on private pay patients because Medicare and Medicaid reimbursements don't generally cover the cost of care provided. But there must be a happy medium where everyone pays their fair share. Consider the routine colonoscopy, a procedure that everyone 50 or over, hopefully, has undergone. I've undergone mine twice. Typical charges for the procedure are $2,500 to $3,500, depending on the geography of the provider and the type of facility. So I looked at this cost and thought from an operations perspective and my back of the napkin calculation, which is very close, the cost should be three to five times less or about $750. That would ensure that it includes well-paid medical staff, doctors, anesthesiologists, nursing, operating support staff, check-in nurses, using top-notch equipment. I didn't (laughs) use shiny tables, new equipment, and I assumed in a class A medical building who would work for six hours a day, not overtime, seeing one patient every 30 minutes. Every other industry adopts operation practices that, that naturally drive down costs. Healthcare must become transparent and competitive. The move toward price transparency has the potential to create true competition among providers with patients being able to see what is being charged for their test, scan, or procedure. That surely could curtail the practice of charging exorbitantly for routine care. Which brings me to point number four. Number four, focus on the continuum of care. For a patient who needs surgery, healthcare doesn't begin on the day of the surgery, nor does it end on that day. The surgery is part of a continuum of care that starts 30 days prior and lasts a similar period of time afterward. It might start with the patient on the couch, researching conditions and providers on a smartphone. Stated simply, all care begins at home with a patient with a real name, not a hospital, not a facility. Technology can enable greater patient choice, allowing them to choose lower acuity settings to receive care or even participate in telehealth. Smartphone healthcare apps that can access a patient's insurance can help ensure consumers visit in network facilities. I like to say, mobile is healthcare's virtual front door. Why? Check out every other successful industry. Hospitals and healthcare systems can leverage technology to bring efficiencies to scheduling and increase patient compliance that ultimately leads to lower costs. The 30-day all-cause national readmission rate is 13.9%, according to 2016 data, but the rate can be varied depending on payer type, geography, and individual hospitals. Lowering the readmission rate by just one percentage point could save billions in healthcare costs and lost productivity. Doctors are happier, patients are happier, nurses importantly are happier, Hospitals are more productive and with less waste. What a deal. Research from Mobile Smith shows that hospitals using perioperative mobile apps can save up to $300 per procedure through a 40% reduction in same-day cancellations and a 7% reduction in 30-day readmissions. So as I look at the conclusion and reiterate the tough road that we have in healthcare that I'm very confident that we can solve, There are four ideas that I would use to get started. One, treat hospitals as last resort providers. Two, move care closer to patients. Three, take cost out of the system. Four, focus on the continuum of care. You know, the cost of family insurance coverage topped $20,000 in 2019, and medical bills comprise fully one-half 
of all overdue credit card debt. Historically, the major payments for a family were the mortgage and the car payment. Well, welcome to today. Move over house and car. Health care is now the number one payment for a family and increasingly for businesses. Chat with Randy. I'm here with Greg Jones, the CTO for Moe Smith Health. Greg, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Greg Jones, uh, Chief Technology Officer of uh, Mobile Smith Health. I've been working with Mobile Smith for about five years, and uh, we are aggressively getting into the patient um, patient encounter environment with the, with the focus on changing healthcare. So, okay, so let's start with a couple of things. Do healthcare services, can healthcare services today run on the cloud? Like, tell us about Azure, or tell us about AWS. Can we move services onto the cloud? And what does that mean to move things to the cloud? Yeah, so uh, yes, we can move things to the cloud. Uh, there are health services moving to the cloud. Uh, there's a lot of investments um, that are already in data centers at hospitals, which is probably one reason why, as a CTO, if I was in that world, to take that investment and then move a whole other world to the cloud, why would I do that? Well, one of the reasons is because it's really hard to make changes in a data center compared to the flexibility and the consistent changing that a cloud has. By consistent changing, I'm saying take a standard infrastructure as, as a service. We don't even talk about infrastructure as a service anymore. We don't even talk about platforms as a service. We don't even talk about software as a service. We talk about serverless architecture. We talk about data lakes. We talk about analytics. We're now moving out of technology and actually talking about business tier type focuses in cloud. So going to the cloud today is no longer a technical challenge. It's more of a business and security concern at a business level. Um, as it relates to healthcare, it is very important to go there because of all of the functionality that's available out there. When we're talking about machine learning, machine learning is that that is not really a technology that's a business vertical of I need a automated system that can detect information, detect disease or issues related to the information I, I can provide to the system. So I have a tech team that worries about how I get all that data in there, but I actually have a service now that can identify healthcare advantages uh, before I even need to go to the hospital. Yeah, you know, I was just going to say, and, and, and if I if I delve down into one area you talked about, um, from a artificial intelligence capabilities. And, and I would think today as data is being collected, we're not trying to replace doctors and nurses in this process with AI. I would think the data, we can make it more readily available to doctors so they can make what? Better decisions, more timely decisions, understand trends, maybe with healthcare, so they can have the proper preparation as they move into today if they were doing 2020 planning. So I, I assume that that AI could allow you to do that, correct? That's correct. So an easier way to see, to think about this is uh, like when I do a online mortgage uh, or, or loan, for example, um, if I have that system set up, there's and if I have a really excellent credit rating, an 850 or whatever credit rating, and I ask for a minimal amount of money, the system is already set up to allow those types of credit to automatically be approved. And so the, let me go to the commercials and say, you can be approved in 10 minutes or less. That is the type of service that can be, that can be done within 10 minutes or less. So you flip that around, flip it around to where we go to, um, I have all this data coming at me, which ones do I need to actually focus on? And so when some things that we want to make sure that the, that the physician and that, that the hospital care focuses on, we want them to focus on the important pieces. We don't want them to maximize their time looking at every single piece of information that is not necessarily a good use of their time. That's great, can, that's, that's great. So what we're doing is we're making them more efficient 
and giving them information to make better decisions. Let's talk about another piece that I know as we think about treating hospitals as last resort providers. You and I talk about this all the time. You give me a hard time about it, but I love the fact that you're so committed to authorization and prior and service and privacy from the perspective. Can you just give a couple of characteristics about why the cloud is so important today in keeping information secure and it does indeed give a secure environment to deal with as we have HIPAA considerations in that process? Yeah, so um, not all cloud technologies are the same. Um, I, when I am talking to uh, senior um, executives at these cloud industries, Microsoft, AWS example, um, I'm, I'm really, what I say to them is, it doesn't matter who's developing any health service I'm providing. I need a patient to be able to log in with their secure, with their secure credentials, and I need that service to maintain that security throughout any service that is provided in the cloud, even down to, so the way that I treat all this is if somebody was to actually hack into my system or hack into a healthcare system, they should only be able to access whatever has been assigned to that person. So if somebody was to get over get my credentials, for example, and they went into a million person database environment, a million patient record system, and they queried that to pull out all information that they could, the only thing they would get out is mine. And that's what the key is in our security is that if you have access to data, no matter how you get into the system, the system is designed to only give you access to the data that has been assigned to that person. It's called zero access. So it's, if you have global access, you get nothing. If you have, unless you have, so we have no, no super users in the system. Got it. So I know you talk to me constantly about access. And, um, and again, I love the fact of how committed you are and your team are to that. Um, two questions left. One, um, scale. So we have 330 million Americans today that are accessing or ultimately will access information. I'm going to ask you two questions. One, does the serverless architecture in the cloud help that? And number two, I know there's lots of different EMRs. Um, and I know we've, we and know hospitals run on multiple different EMRs. Is there a way to that we can provide a way, a capability for hospitals to access multiple EMRs and give a consistent front? So let's start with 330 million Americans. Is that a concern from a, a volume perspective, running on AWS or Azure or any other cloud? It's um, it's manageable. And the, the way I always look at it when we're talking about that level of, of information is if I tell you that, if I, if I convert that into an IoT perspective, if I have a million devices uh, that I have to maintain, is that a problem in the cloud? And most people are like, no, an IoT environment for a million devices is not a problem. Now, if I say a million people, we sh technically it should be treated the same. It's it's a million things that are constantly, that potentially could constantly be asking or, or giving or retrieving information. And I need an architecture, I need a environment that can maintain that in a loose, in a loosely coupled way that I can, Whole analytics without having to build unique analytics for every single thing. I need those services provided to me. And therefore I need a partner that can I can use to maintain that because I just don't have time to build all those. That's where cloud comes in. That's where those services come in. And healthcare, if I look at it from a from a doctor's perspective, it's very specific. If I look at it from a data scientist perspective, it's just a, another way of implementing a common way of, of data that is in either a, not necessarily a factory, but an IoT device in a factory is still sending temperature and measurement. My pain levels, uh, my exercise tracking, those are just measurements as well. So that type of, of world definitely needs a cloud environment to be able to grow uh, financially. Otherwise, I want the capacity to do it in a data center is so complicated to do it that way, I'd rather um, go to the cloud and let the Microsofts and the Azures and the Googles 
handle that level of infrastructure so I can really focus on providing the services to the customers and to you know improve healthcare in the future. So great. So I, I, I think that if I look at the first challenge and if we're looking at curbing healthcare costs and we've talked about four ways to do it, Greg, I really appreciate your insight. We talked about treating hospitals as last resort providers. We talked about the cloud is here, it's ready to go. We talked about the ability to authorize that uniquely for for patients. We talked about the ability to distribute information. Um, Scale is not a problem for 330 million Americans, but there is technology available today, starting today, that we could have a common face across a distributed architecture and move from brick and mortar to much more of a patient-focused distributed architecture for healthcare. Um, Greg, I really appreciate Greg Jones, CTO of Mobile Smith. Thank you very much for your time and your insight. Thank you, Randy. Appreciate it. So I want to thank all the wonderful healthcare professionals that joined us here today on Healthcare Aptitude. I would love to hear your feedback. I really enjoy your questions and give us any views on how together we could explore future opportunities to improve healthcare. And I'd love to have you as a guest on this radio show. So let's set up the next show. What we'll do, given that it's timely, is we'll explore the political views with our upcoming election and what they mean to health care here in America, what the candidates' platforms do, and what we might be able to help influence those platforms to transform health care for the better for all from a cost standpoint and from a quality outcome Because, again, that's what we're working for is 330 million Americans that receive health care. So that's a wrap on our first episode of Healthcare Aptitude. Remember to catch the show on Healthcare Now Radio every weekday at 7 a.m., 3 p.m., and 11 p.m. Eastern Time. For more information, visit www.mobilesmith.com. Enjoy the day. See you next time. Thank you for listening to another episode of Healthcare Aptitude with your host, Randy Tomlin, and sponsored by Mobile Smith Health. Be sure to tune in weekdays at 7 a.m., 3 p.m., and 11 p.m. Eastern Time on Healthcare Now Radio.